We've got a great session planned here today. This is Synergy Exploration, and we've got a panel of three presenters here for you this morning. Karen Isbell, she oversees the prospect development and analytics reporting, gifts, and records administration, data management, web application developer teams for the University of Michigan's 500 member development community. She serves on the VP for development's senior management team. The campaign leadership team has served in multiple roles over the past five years of implementation of the university enterprise fundraising software. We also have Mary Ann Pelletier. Mary Ann is a senior consultant for the consulting services team in Cornell's Alumni Affairs and Development Division. And she has over 25 years experience as a manager of prospect research and as an analytics expert and instructor serving as director of prospect research for Cornell University and Carnegie Mellon University and serving as software consultant for Datatel Corporation. Also, we have Ashutosh Nandeshwar. He is author of Tableau Data Visual Data Visualization Cookbook. He is one of the few analytics professionals in the higher education industry who has developed analytical solutions for all stages of student life cycle from recruitment to giving. So please welcome our panel. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you. Good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, for this discussion. It's, and I really hope we will have some discussion today. Wow, Howard Behar was right. Those lights are really oh, bright. Yeah. <laughs> uh, some discussion about synergies between learning opportunities that, that folks will get here at the Drive uh, conference this week, as well as things that, that APRA offers. And I'm hoping to hear from you of, of other learning opportunities uh, that we'll, we can explore together. Really what we're hoping is to, if you're in prospect development, which is where APRA focuses is its activity, that you'll come away with some context as you go to sessions throughout the conference uh, for the next two days uh, that perhaps can be picked up in future learnings through APRA. Um, also want to learn, we want to have a little bit of discussion about um, where are the gaps in our education as analytics professionals, data professionals, information professionals in the fundraising field, particularly in the area of prospect development. So a little bit about APRA. Um, I'm actually, I don't know if there's, we had a great introduction from John. I don't know if you guys, we were going to introduce ourselves. So or did we, I think we covered all the highlights. I want to make sure we don't leave anything, behind, leave anything off the table. But APRA, what is it, if you're not familiar? Uh, APRA stands for the Association of Professional Researchers for Advancement. It's a professional organization uh, for those who work partic particularly in prospect development. It's 27 years old, um, and uh, it covers folks who do prospect research, folks who do relationship management within their jobs, and perhaps most relevant for this audience, folks who do uh, data analytics. APRA's strategic plan ultimately revolves around primarily education and professional development for folks uh, in this field. We have about 2,000 members, and ultimately we work to advocate uh, with audiences within the fundraising industry and sometimes outside of the fundraising industry about our field, uh, about ethical standards, about um, how we train ourselves and incorporate how incorporating data-driven prospect management planning into our fundraising operations uh, provides real impact. Uh, so again, today our session is really a 50,000 foot view uh, about how we can use a conference like DRIVE to further our collective education and move the field forward. Uh, hopefully to get some dialogue going, but there are a few things we want to share with you today. And certainly we want to think about getting information from you about how we can serve ultimately our membership and the field of prospect development analytics uh, better through our collective educational offerings. So to learn a little bit more about, oh, actually I did want to share something too because the little papers that were out today with all the key takeaways from the session somehow uh, got a little bit mixed up and there were two on there that weren't ours and I looked at it and I was like, did we say that that's what the takeaways were? Because I want to make sure that, that you know what you're, what you're in for. Um, our key takeaways from today hopefully will be um, that you will gain knowledge of additional learning opportunities that can be synced with learning at Drive. Um, introduction to APRA's new body of knowledge, which is going to be rolled out later this year, and we've, we're going to have a handout coming around with a little bit of a sneak peek of what that's going to look like, which is it's a defined set of competence, competencies. Excuse me. Mm, I need water. Competency, comp, all right, leave that alone. <laughs> Skill. Skill sets needed to grow successfully in the field, and certainly then understanding what a professional association like APRA has to offer and its role uh, in the work that we do. So uh, just for some clarification there. 
Um, we have a slide here. We want to talk a little bit about, well, actually, I should have had this one up before. This is APRA's uh, vision and mission statements. Uh, again, just for further edification of, again, who we are. Mary Ann's going to talk a little bit, uh, though, about sort of what makes up our membership and what kinds of folks belong to APRA. I'm, I'm guessing some of you. So well, here, there's that. Sue. Right. So the first question is, is um, do you mind raising your hand? Do you mind waving your hand if you're a member of APRA already? So if you look around, uh, we have about half. My inner statistician is having a great time. Thank you very much for satisfying <laughs> that need. Um, the membership is made up, uh, we do have a, hard, a high focus in higher education, but so does DRIVE, right? Um, and uh, our second largest contingency is healthcare. And then after that, we have other organizations that can afford to focus full-time staff on research and are now starting to focus full-time staff on analytics. And it makes perfect sense <laughs> that um, uh, they would be that universities especially would uh, be able to splinter responsibilities enough that they would be able to have analytics people as well. Um, when we did the survey, we survey regularly, and part of the survey is for us to understand our services, and part of the survey is for you all to go to your boss and say, I'm underpaid, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we do have uh, bachelor's degrees and uh, lots of advanced degrees involved in, uh, in APRA as well. So we're, uh, we are in education and we do education. Um, so when we looked at our survey, when we talked about what is the primary responsibility of the people who are APRA membership, you'll see that analytics and reporting pay a key role. And I don't know if this, you have this experience, you know, when, when uh, you, you know, somebody used to write a report with a list and numbers on it, and they used to call it a report, but now they call it analytics because that's the buzzword, <laughs> right? So we still have that. We still have, you know, lots of people who are engaged in that, but also we have, um, we have people whose job really is reporting, dashboarding, pro, uh, management resources. And so now Ashu is going to talk about industry trends. So I got about two years worth of sun right here. I know, <laughs> I know Seattle is causing some sun problems. I recently moved from Michigan to California, so I've been enjoying the sun really a lot. Don't rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is kind of given that data reporting and analytics and visualization is a trend. Can you give me a couple of reasons why that is important? Yes. That's right. So he said that other industries who have adopted data analytics are doing better than their competitors, or at least they have a chance in being that competitive advantage. So that's, that definitely is very, very true. Did you know that about 70% 70 70 of sales that happen on Amazon are based on recommendations? And close to 40 to 50% of all the recommendations or all the movies that you watch on Netflix are based on recommendations. Can you imagine having that kind of income just sitting and it's just automatically happening, recurring? But that's because they are putting that emphasis to study the data, analytics, and visualizing that. So that's definitely a trend <coughs> in corporates, but it's very, very important that we pick up on those and try to improve the prospect development. So the first thing that obviously is people are asking for is how can they get information? So that's a good start. Some institutions are better than others where the, these practices are not built in. But we definitely want to keep an eye on that and try to improve the information, the access to information, and try to provide the data and analytics that is needed. But obviously, as the industry is taking shape, we are seeing that education is also becoming a key component. Obviously, you have courses on Coursera, or your traditional community colleges or universities are offering your data science degrees or whatsoever. But as Karen said in, uh, earlier, we need to figure out a proper way for us. And obviously, there are lots of offerings that Karen and Marian are going to speak about later. But that's definitely a key trend, and we need to keep an eye on it. Great. So as we think about uh, some of the kinds of, oh, I got it. Thank you. Uh, some of the kinds of education uh, that are out there and the tools and the skill sets uh, that we need to be successful and how it's changing like every other day, um, you know, 
certainly you'll see a lot, there are a lot of sessions and some of them are listed here on this slide, here, offered here at Drive that are very specific to folks who work in prospect development. Things about uh, how to create um, more robust prospect management programs, thinking about predictive modeling and how that can be used, data mining, all of the things that we use. And, and, and in many cases, uh, those of us who work in analytics do it either specifically, you know, sort of it was born out of a research shop, and so it's focused primarily on the major gifts program. Obviously, many of us also do work with annual giving, with stewardship, um, with our HR teams. There are so many applications that we're still discovering about how we can use analytics in our fundraising operations. Uh, I think it's really important that we, uh, that we focus on not A, providing opportunities so that no one is having to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of great ideas out there. New ones are coming up every day. And having v various venues that, where we can share those ideas, I think, is really key. One of the things I've heard from Chris Sorensen and the folks who uh, plan the DRIVE conference um, that's really cool about DRIVE, and actually I actually heard Walt uh, Dreyfus also from um, UW say yesterday uh, in a meeting that we were in, is that we tend to, and certainly you'll find this at most um, sort of uh, conferences put together for folks who work in the same industry. We all get together and we say, hey, I have this great idea and the person across, and I work in the same field as you, and the person across the table says, that is great and my idea is great too, and we're talking to folks who work within the same industry. One of the nice things about Drive is that they pull in folks from other industries. Um, because let's face it, fundraising um, as an industry in, in the space of analytics is way behind the curve. We've come to this game pretty late uh, compared to our for-profit uh, peers. And so we want to make sure that we're capitalizing on the knowledge that they've already gained, figuring out what they've done that we can take uh, and use for our business, and also then you know, sort of how we can make things that are unique to us and unique to the, the work that we do. And so certainly Drive is going to be a great way um, to kick off that um, the kick off that opportunity. Um, there are obviously other venues to get education. So APRA offers a data analytics symposium and, and we're offering a data analytics boot camp later this year. Uh, the Drive Conference is now in its third year. Our vendor partners um, often have lots of educational offerings too, as well as other professional associations. Uh, things like CASE and AASP are starting to um, have offerings in this area as well. So there are a lot of places you can go to get your education. And ultimately, we want to make sure that the messaging is consistent uh, across all of our organizations and that the folks who are having to consume the information and the education are the ones who are dictating what it is that they need to know. Um, interestingly, you know, there's also a lot of great sharing that goes on every day, even outside of conference, on uh, in online forums. So I know, Marianne, um, maybe you can just talk a little bit about uh, the Listserv Prospect DMM, which has been around, I don't know, how long has that Listserv sure. been in operation? Sure, I think it um, started in 2007 or 2008, and it was, uh, it's a collection of people who do uh, DMM work um, and just about anywhere. So it's uh, organically grown, grassroots. Um, and it was the group that brought together the first analytics symposium in APRA. Um, people from all uh, walks of nonprofit life. And it's uh, newcomers who come in and go, tell me how do I get started? And people who want to debate whether or not email is endogenous to giving or, you know. And so at any level, you can engage. Fantastic. I think, too, you know, when we think about the, the growth of analytics in the fundraising field, Probably, I don't know, Marianne, and you can speak to this better than I can, uh, 15 years ago, a decade ago, it was mostly about building models. Yes. And now... Major you know, gifts. Yep. I think we think about, now we think about a conference like Drive, and say even if you look at the last uh, section down there, that, that Ash, the uh, session that Ashu is going to be uh, presenting uh, tomorrow, I believe, um, about data visualization and how do we think about not only how do we get the data, figure out how our leadership uses the data, but how do we make it prettier and easier for them to consume? And so the, the whole realm of data visualization is just one more layer. And who knows five years from now what the latest and greatest thing will be. Um, yesterday, I had the opportunity to sit in on an executive summit with leaders from uh, other institutions uh, across the country who uh, we heard from a really fascinating uh, professor from the new, uh, NYU Stern School of Business who sort of you know, gave us a little bit of historical perspective about 
um, how our, our society is moving from one that is very sort of business-based to one that is certainly much more consumer-based. And he said, interestingly, when you, know, you think about the birth of technology and, and computers and, and all of those things that as they were developed over time, originally those things were all developed with, with business or government in mind. And then later was sort of you know, pared down uh, to put in, in, term, um, in a format that the everyday consumer could use. And he said the shift that's been happening over the last decade or so is that as new technology and innovation comes forward, it's starting with the consumer. So you think about things like mobile devices and social media. Those are, have been designed with the end user in mind. Uh, and, and then business and government comes in and says, hey, how can we use that? How can we tap into that? So there's been this sort of radical shift, and, and there's uh, more to come. But hearing from thought leaders like that was fantastic. And so when we think about sort of where our field and the work that we're going to be asked to do, what, what that might look like five or 10 years from now, it could be radically different from where we are. These are just a handful of offerings that, um, or, or ways that APRA uh, shares education with its community. Um, we have uh, our annual conference. This year is in Las Vegas, so if you've never been to Las I haven't ever been to Las Vegas, so I don't know, I'm looking forward to that. Um, but that will include a number of uh, not only the conference sessions, but a data analytics symposium, uh, a uh, number of workshops, um, 54 sessions uh, on seven tracks, I believe. So there's a lot of opportunity to not only come and learn the specifics about um, analytics, data visualization, but also then how it can be applied um, in a robust way and how other folks are doing that in their shops. We offer a number of symposia, we have a quarterly magazine, uh, and we offer other regional conferences like our MERC conference, which is going to be in Pennsylvania uh, this spring. So quick yes, please. That is, that's the association's yep. main website, and from there um, you can take a look at what sort of all the specifics are, what membership entails, events that are coming up, online or learning opportunities, all of that. Also, if you're thinking about the, uh, the list serve that we just referred to, it's prospect-dmm, and it's sponsored by MIT. So you should be able to find it to get to the major domo or whatever we have to do now. Yes. To get hooked in. <laughs> so obviously, there's a lot that's, that's offered that APRA has to offer. And one of the, the most exciting things that we're actually giving this group a sneak peek at, and I don't know, uh, I think we were going to look for some uh, volunteers to pass out, uh, send a handout around if we haven't already. Oh, we've already sent it. Fantastic. I don't even have to worry about it. You um, really can't see from up here. You know, <laughs> it's we're pretty blind. So I um, want to share a little bit uh, with this group because it's going to be rolling out in the next couple of months. We've got a team still working to finish it up, is APRA's body of knowledge. And I'm going to try that word competency one more time. And it is a set of competencies for folks who work um, in different domains. So there will be competencies for prospect research, for relationship management, uh, and for analytics. Uh, both Ashu and Marianne worked on the team that put together the, co the competencies for analytics. And we've got just a little sneak peek of that. Um, I think one side of the handout sort of talks about the body of knowledge as a whole, how it can be used, um, and, and sort of how we're hoping it will roll out. And the second side then has just the level one competencies for analytics uh, that were put together. And ultimately, what we're hoping is that uh, these will be mapped to learning opportunities. So Marianne, why don't you take it away? And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the body of knowledge, what it could mean for professionals in our industry. There's Thanks that. very much. Mm -hmm. So. Um, we, when we polled our membership, when we polled our uh, analytics membership about what was important to them, we found out that we really had two populations. Uh, the first are people who were fundraiser or prospect researchers who, needed, who wanted to learn analytics and meld it into analytics um, uh, fields and jobs and careers. And that's, I'm an example of that. The second are uh, statisticians who came to fundraising. And Ashu, are you an example of that? Yes. Yes, so there you go. So we're, we're balanced. Um, and Karen's the Wrangler who has to deal with us. So uh, when we took a look at those, we uh, figured out what the big domains were. And those were the two things. This is, I come with this skill set. I need to catch up to this. And we started building the body of knowledge around that. And that was the competency. 
Also, we discovered in nonprofit environments, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but people would say, we need to add this nifty great thing because the people down the street are. So can you just like read a book and start doing it? <laughs> right? Have you experienced that? We want you to take on this skill set. We'll give you all the training you need, but we just cut the budget. So, <laughs> so we also have the opportunity through the uh, very cost effective ways that we offer um, basic training. Um, and so we are looking at analytics boot camp coming up uh, next year. Um, and so that's for people who I'm in fundraising. I have to add this function to my shop. Help me get started. And analytics, like uh, unlike any other fundraising skill that I've had to learn, it's one where I really feel like I had to go back to school. Do you know what I mean? How many of you started as statisticians? OK, thank you. And how many of you started as something else, and now you had to learn some form of analytics, even if it's just visualization. Thanks very much. OK, so, so uh, for you, it's how do I understand the ethos of what just happened to me, right? I'm in, a, in an environment, and it feels very different from the for-profit place that I just was. Are you experiencing that as well? OK, you're not, OK, you don't want to talk about it. All right. <laughs> so we have those. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have people who are like, I'm trying to figure out um, what is the pattern of annual giving that it both increases participation and revenue. I'm trying to figure out what do I do with social media that's going to get me from I've got a Twitter handle to this is this person in the database. And by the way, this person is a maven for my institution and therefore needs to be cultivated in other ways, right? So as a prospect in my personal life, I am a difficult prospect because the traditional means of moving me are, uh, the traditional means of moving a prospect is to invite to events, have personal visits with high powered people, and then make the ask. I don't like any of that. I don't want to sit at lunch with somebody worried that I'm going to spill something on my shirt, because I always do, and have them tell me, and have them suck up to me. That makes me really uncomfortable. I want to help with projects. I want to sit in the background. I want to do that sort of thing. So the organization that I volunteer with, they're always saying, will you come to this event? And I'm like, no. And it's not a lack of infinity. So how do we distinguish me from people who want that kind of splash? And do those people still exist? And I believe that we, in the, in the cutting edge, when we looked at the advanced section that you see on our illustration here, that's the place where we're trying to figure out what's the next thing that we need to measure in order to get inside the heads of the people that we want to build friendships with, as, uh, as Howard was saying. So I'm going to hand this back to Ashu to talk about the details, because he's way better at that than I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, Karen, if, you, if it makes uh, you feel better, uh, you were trying to say competencies. I did the biggest blunder of my life. At one point of time, I was uh, discussing something with my friends, and I wanted to say that I reinvent. I want to reinvent my life, and instead of saying that, I said I want to reinvent my wife. And obviously, <laughs> uh, if my wife were there, obviously she would be very, very mad. But all the guys around me, they said, "Yeah, man, how do you do that?" <laughs> so I hope that makes you feel a little better. Thank you. And Thank I also you. noticed that the light will make my hunch show up, so I will try to stand really straight. Uh, so I worked on this body of knowledge for analytics. I was really fortunate to work with a fantastic group of people uh, wh whose names we will see on the next slide. But here were some of the key areas that we said that these are the areas that we should focus as an analytics as a profession. Obviously, the top, I don't think there is any hierarchy or precedence on which ones are better or which ones should be prioritized. All of those are important. But obviously, you cannot start working on a project unless you have those project management skills. And one of the key components in an analytics professional or a data professional is rejecting the questions that don't yield into action. I know how many times you have faced this dilemma where your leadership sees something interesting and they will say, oh, I want this report, I want this chart, or I want this something, and then you spend maybe a couple of days on it, and then what happens? It just sits on a desk and nothing happens. So we need to as analytics professionals, as data professionals, we need to build that practice into ourselves that we will only seek those projects which yield into action or which yield into some kind of an answer. Can I interrupt you? I have to tell you, when Ashu was at University of Michigan, uh, he just left us in Dece December for Caltech. He came into a meeting with our senior management team, and uh, he had the word interesting written on the paper, and he was giving an update on sort of analytics projects. And he said, OK, this word interesting, and he did this. 
it was very dramatic and they all went ooh and he says <laughs> we're not working on the interesting we're working on the things that drive us forward so um, he means what he says <laughs> And obviously, the second one is data manipulation. You cannot work on data unless you know how to manipulate. So you need to learn all the key technologies. You need to know uh, relationships of databases, how they work. You need to know the SQL language. That's very, very important. Obviously, you need to know the tools who can handle, which can handle this type of data. So data manipulation skills, are obviously, are very, very important. You need to know statistical techniques. You can start with, uh, Marianne said, a couple of examples. But obviously, you need to start somewhere. And one of the things that many people are interested in is in predictive modeling of major gifts. Who are those people who are likely to make a gift to us? So you can start there and then build upon those. And obviously, the, the industry that we are in is really taking shape into this data science. So it is not only useful coming up with something, but it's actually, again, you have to make the audience take some action. So you have to build those tools, not only analysis, but the tools part of it. So that's kind of the advanced statistical piece of it is that it's not only the statistical analysis, but actually it's coming with those tools, coming up with that portals, coming up with some kind of a product that they can use. Then visualization, as Karen mentioned, obviously you have to again make data very accessible. One of the best ways to do that is using some kind of visualization. And there are multiple theories about those. I have one talk tomorrow, so please feel free to join. Communication is also very, very important. It doesn't matter how good your theory is. You might be 99.99% accurate. But if you cannot communicate your results well with the audience, they're not going to care. They will say, I don't understand that. I'm not going to buy it. So communication is very key. And again, as data professionals, it might be very hard for us to come to an agreement to that. Mm -hmm. Our bias might always be, oh, my theory is really, really good. It's better than everything that you see outside. But at the end, it doesn't matter. Because they don't understand it, they're not going to buy it. So that's, I think, one area that we should definitely try to focus on and try to improve ourselves in, is how do we better communicate? And again, going to the action piece of it. Fundraising knowledge, obviously, that's given. You cannot be in a business unless you understand the business. So you have to understand the business. And obviously, there are tons of resources to get familiarized with your fundraising if you're coming from the outside. And the last one is change management. Again, this is kind of going back to the project management skills is some people are happy just to go with what they have. Most of us are. But we need to make sure that we are giving them the tools, we are giving them the proper information that we believe in, but we are creating the change and we are asking them to walk with us on that journey. But it cannot come again unless you have done all those six things that you see on the top. But you have to have the strategic thinking. You have to look forward. You can look back and say, OK, these were interesting figures. We did this in fiscal 13. We did this in fiscal 12. But it's not telling us anything. So we have to bring us all that together and propose that uh, strategic thinking to our leadership and everybody else who is interested in that. And Marianne is going to speak about how this is going to roll out. The, the next slide, we do okay. have hope, hoping that you'll see some names that may be familiar to you. Oh, yeah. Uh, on this, uh, that these are the folks who worked on the analytics body of knowledge. And um, so some really great, I think, uh, thought leaders in this area, folks who have done really wonderful things for their institutions and continue to give back to, to APRA, the association, to be able to teach others. So uh, really appreciated this group getting together um, for several months and pulling this information together. The, the neat part is, you know, uh, Ashu, mentioned earlier Netflix, and of course I'm thinking, while well, he's talking about Netflix and how they manage us, I'm thinking about their million dollar prize that we were actually, a couple of us on the DMM and then in APRA were considering trying to pitch in to do. Um, and so at the DMM conference coming up in July, we're, we're trying to wrangle a speaker, and I may be the one, to talk about Kaggle.com where you do analytics competitions, and sometimes you can get $5,000, and sometimes you can get a job with Google. So um, this is the kind of uh, passion that we're interested in. I think that there's at least a couple of us that are um, speakers here this week. So we're really happy that we've already have some crossover. Um, so when uh, uh, what we're trying to do to manage our, to take care of our membership, is we are trying to build information that helps with your career, and we're trying to give you tools to, to give you success. Because Howard really uh, 
he really touched my heart when he talked about the feeling that he wasn't of value anymore. And when you read the, the articles, the LinkedIn article that came out a couple months ago about what are the top 10 reasons people leave, the first one is they don't feel that they're adding value. So it's not the paycheck and all the things that we all assume as Americans, as, as you know, self-indulgent, competitive Americans. It's not the free Volvo. It's really, when I go to work, I want to feel like at the end of the day, I made, it, I made something happen. Um, so the competencies we want to help with is we want to provide the opportunity for professional growth. Professional growth also includes access to people you can bounce things off of. Uh, we, I work in an environment where I'm, on a, I'm finally on a group of six people who are all really into this. And so we stand around and, in the cubicle space that we're in and we like, go off about stuff. And our department head walks in and she just looks around, she shakes her head, she walks out. Um, but we come up with uh, data management, analytics, and visualizations that can actually speak English to people who are accustomed to talking to people. And it takes that kind of work. So we, it provides, APRA is a wider space where the access is available. I have people I can call when I get stuck on something. When, uh, when, we, work about, when we talk about recruitment, we have a long history with prospect research. We actually have job descriptions that are borrowed from organizations that need to start prospect research. Sometimes, you know, a body at rest tends to remain at rest. A body that has to add a position to tends to not want to add that position because of all the paperwork, right? So the, we're working on that now to build in the uh, opportunity for analytics, crafting job descriptions, crafting competency sets. It not only helps you to give yourself a target, it helps you give your supervisor a target, and it does really help with the pay scale question. Um, because you can say, I'm here, I'm at a senior level according to the industry experts, and so I want to, um, you know, I want to be, I want to have that recognized for that. The sharing of metrics, and metrics for us, I mean, how do we measure metrics? So, you know, have you done a better model than me? Um, I don't know, because your model, your, what you do has to fit your organization's needs. Um, so the, the, the piece there is the ability to say, the, I don't know if you run into this. I work for a very large university and I work for an Ivy. So people call me all the time and say, my supervisor wants me to benchmark with our peer institutions about how you do this. And what that means is, just like Ashu was saying, I don't understand what you're talking about. Can you go find out what the other people are doing and come back and then I'll feel better about letting you do it. Do you run into that? Do you get the benchmarking question? Or is it your supervisors that get the benchmarking question? I'm seeing some nods. I'm really having difficulty. Okay, so the the piece about just having to just being able to say right up front, because I did get this question: Who else in our industry? Who else in our, our of our peers is actually doing analytics? I got that question two years ago, and my answer was: We're the only Ivy that doesn't have it institutionalized yet. And then I became a full-time analytics person, so they it was heard. And then of course. Um, the last piece is that uh, wherever you may feel like you want to have some growth or wherever you may feel like you need to fill in something, you, uh, the APRA is working really hard at making sure that we have that offering. So um, I was at a working session. I was um, actually at the, the board meeting a couple days ago, and one of the things that we talked about was the gap, fill the gap. And I never think of anything as a deficit. I always think of opportunities. Everything is an opportunity, right? I've got an apple tree. It's an opportunity to make apple sauce. And so I now have apple sauce. You know what I mean? So um, I have an old laptop, so I'm crunching Bitcoin right now. That's, that's, you know, I love that stuff. So I don't think of gaps as uh, something that I should put on my performance review as something I need to do something about. I see it as an opportunity. So if you find a gap in your institution, fill the gap. You can take the lead that way. And uh, to me, that's great stuff. How are you all doing? You're very quiet. <laughs> Nobody's <laughs> arguing with us. No, I'm going to get them to talk and hear That's the next slide. OK. Well, then let's get on with that. Thank you. <laughs> it even says you're up. So you know, I did say at the beginning that I was hoping we could have a little bit of discussion, because we've kind of given a lot of overview about what APRA has to offer, what we're hoping to accomplish, uh, the rollout of the body of knowledge. but. One of the things that we realized is that um, you know, we don't have all the answers. And as I said earlier, we need the folks who need to consume the education to be able to tell us where those opportunities or where those gaps are. 
Um, and so certainly, I would love to hear from all of you, some of you who have, this may be your third time at Drive, this may be your first time at Drive, um, what are some of the great takeaways that you get from this conference or that you're hoping to get from this conference that you'll be able to bring back? So there are a lot of APRA members, and so I wanna hear from you, as well as folks who may, this may be the first time you've ever heard of APRA, um, what are some of the key things that you get from a conference like Drive that you're able to take back to your work? How many of you are dealing with the time change? <laughs> like, is this, is this a kind of an energy management no, thing? No, see, you or? missed it, Marianne. You're supposed to let the silence sit. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I stink at that, Karen. I'm sorry. <laughs> You mean the corporate fundraising side? Exactly. So the, the, the response was, you know, context is, is sort of potentially where there's sometimes a gap, particularly in working in the, with the corporate fundraising team. And I don't know, are there folks here who have, who do analytics, data visualization, any of those areas who have a really close working relationship with their corporate fundraising team? Yes. Yes, others? Or is that something it's really, is it typically more focused on individuals? Embedded, I would say. And then they can create a bridge for data analytics to kind of pull them in. Because mm -hmm. um, they sort of see what the needs of the fundraising team are and they, and they can kind of go, oh, wait a minute. This, this would be a great analytics project, let's call it. Application to data analytics and then bring that body into that environment. That makes a lot of sense. I know that there's a lot of folks who are kind of set up that way where the sort of the researchers are the boots on the ground and figuring out which other pieces they need to pull in from their, their data teams. Yep. Is that with the individual side or with the corporate side or both? What do you mean individual? Well, for instance, I mean, if I'm going to be researching a big prospect, it could be a person that works at a certain place, and that's okay for that individual. But if I'm really doing research on Coca-Cola as a foundation, for instance, that's a whole different side of it. So we have a foundations and corporate relations office. We also have a major gifts office, Right now, most of the research and the prospect management goes toward individuals mm -hmm. as opposed to the corporate realm. So that's really the deficit, to use that word, or the opportunity. Yeah. There's, do you want to answer his question? Sorry. Sorry, there's a, a gentleman named Darren Cooper who's active with APRA DMM. I can't remember where he's working now, um, but it's uh, two R's. And he um, actually did a study on analytics of corporate relations and an analytics and foundation relations. And so if you want to reach out to somebody, I'd start with him. Darren, D-A-R-R-E-N, and then Cooper, like Mini Cooper. Fantastic. Brilliant man. I'm Marianne Pelletier. Yeah, spell that any way you want. <laughs> you won't come up with anything new. Where, where else have others sort of seen gaps in education for the work that you're being asked to do in your shops? Or how are you getting it if you're not getting it through someplace like APRA or Drive? What other resources are you tapping for your teams? Yeah. Something, um, just a recommendation. I feel that in any analytics work I've done or members of my team has done, it's one of those skill sets that, like many, grows with experience. And a lot of the educational opportunities are really great, very academic, but not very hands-on practical. Mm -hmm. And I wonder mm -hmm. if there could be maybe an ongoing class where every week you get an assignment do this kind of analytics and co-present with your group, which then, hmm. of course, helps you with your communication. Like, what did I do? How did I accomplish this? And that way, 
instead of doing it one time in three days and thinking about it and then going back to your desk and being distracted by mm -hmm. everything else, then you've got homework. And it's, it's that practice, I think, especially in analytics, that would help members of my team. That's a really neat idea. Tell, we've talked about this a little bit um, in terms of thinking about how we offer education to the analytics community. And is it the same as you, it might be for a group of prospect researchers? And that sort of lends itself to like an online type of a forum, as opposed to obviously you can't get everybody to, to come repeatedly. Um, and so that's really something interesting yeah. that will. It sounds like, you're, I mean, almost a Coursera kind of class, right? And so when we, when we did DMM, we tried to do, we've adapted, we did a lot of things over the last uh, five or six years that we've offered that symposium. One of them was, you know, we had people come in with their laptops and we did a session where they were doing the analytics along with us. Because over the next two days, we're gonna sit still and watch someone tell us theory, and we're gonna hope to remember enough of it that when we go back, we'll get to use it and impress, you know, and, and, and move along. So the cementing of the technique Mm -hmm. is something we actually talk about a lot yeah. in a way that's affordable for you, practical to use. But also, if I'm gonna give you a homework assignment, it's gotta be directly related to your job because I'm not gonna ask you to spend your Sunday morning doing this homework assignment. Well, and also it has to be related to the knowledge you have to gain about understanding your infrastructure. Yes. So it can't be a, I just recently went to a, a visualization thing, which was great, and we did examples based on their example day -based. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yep. Great. It's not my data. I'm not familiar with it. I need to practice with things that I need to know about. To get started and build your confidence. Uh, and uh, Asha, you were talking earlier about you know how do we we do this brilliant work and we test it and we know exactly you know and we're sitting in front of a group of fundraisers who are used to show me the list of people and we're like no you don't understand the R squared on this is 0.56. <laughs> right. That is hot. And that's. <laughs> Was there, I think somebody had their hand up uh, over here earlier. Yeah. So I've had some uh, challenges trying to communicate um, with our folks in annual fund, the new annual fund analysts. Mm -hmm. um, I think primarily because they come from a market research background. Um, and so I find that when you sort of break through some of that ice, we're talking about the same thing, but the terminology is very different. Okay. You want a translator tool. Can, let's write so, an app. So just term, in terms of thinking about, we spend so much time, we spend a lot of time because you know research, relationship management, those are really major gifts tools. So thinking about having opportunities to figure out how we talk in that annual giving space and how we might have to, what sort of things folks would need to know to be able to communicate with folks who come from that different type of market, um, marketing background, is that yeah, what? And your first reaction from that may be, give me the magic bullet, but don't change how I do my job. Because annual giving is so complex that if it's a behemoth, to try, if you make one little change, the behemoth you know, barrels along. Uh, so uh, you have to build a comfort level first. It sounds like that's a big theme. Build a comfort level with the audience. Yeah. How do we talk to fundraisers? It's great. We're gonna do a, you and I, we should talk about that. <laughs> Ashu just gets up and like does really cool stuff that they kind of ooh and ah and they don't know what it is they just learn but they they liked it so he's got like yeah. the, he's like the gift officer whisperer it, I don't know how he does that is so. it pretty <laughs> is it pretty colors and flashing lights or no subliminal messaging yes over here. Okay. Okay. And, and examples from other institutions, like how are they using it? You know, is this if it's a major gift model, is it appropriate for a discovery officer? Is it a major gift model, is it appropriate for someone in leadership? You know, um, and you know, you have limited time. Right. So, how do you? What's your elevator speech? You know, really kind of getting that down so that people can take action. 
Absolutely. Right. It's got to be quick enough that it's easily grasped. They can get in, they can get out, and feel like they've got something meaty to work with. So I think we've got time for one more question. Uh, I'm sorry, waiting back there. Yeah, yes, you. <laughs> Gotcha. And so having like a baseline would be awesome. You know, and that's I mean and, and that's something for us to think about. I think it, the hard part is that is we've seen as analytics shops have popped up in organizations across the country that we all do it just a little bit differently. You know, does it live, does analytics live with the, um, the reporting and the IT folks, or does it live in the prospect development shop, and, and, and how do, what's the differences in how those teams are able to work with one another? Um, I think that's a really interesting question for us to think about, you know, how we can, you know, even think about sort of like a toolkit for ways you might get started. Um, I had the opportunity to write an article for AFP's Advancing Philanthropy magazine last fall, um, and that's an audience that doesn't, you know, that, that, you know unlike a, a higher education audience where we've got more folks in this space, AFP members, those kinds of organizations are less likely um, to have um, big data teams and thinking about um, talking to that audience about why they would want it what it actually means that you can't just, you know, do like Marianne said, say, hey, I heard about this thing, you know, you're doing, you know, X job over here, I want you to start doing some of that in addition to your job and, and make it really cool, because that's the thing that everybody's doing. So, um, you know, having to say things like, you can't just say, you know, I'm gonna peel off a part of your job and, and, and we're gonna be awesome at this. It needs to be, I, if we're gonna do it, we're gonna, we're actually gonna go in and we're gonna provide resources and we're gonna provide training. So. Um, I've got a, a table, why don't we, uh, a table out here with the sponsors area. Let's chat a little bit after you can find me later. So I think we're just about out of time and uh, we're wrapping up, but I appreciate your conversation. I think what we should have done is probably had a slide with our email addresses on it, um, but um, we, you can certainly find us. I think all of our information is in the, the drive so. sponsor or speaker uh, details, and I think we all gave our LinkedIn's and our Somewhere Twitter's the and all that stuff. Somewhere. So, <laughs> so we would like to continue this conversation because we are, you know, APRA's role certainly is to try to figure out how we, how we serve this community. Um, and certainly we were really thrilled that Drive gave us the opportunity um, to be a part of this audience and to get feedback from this group. Um, and I'm really hoping that you all learn lots and take it back to your organizations. Um, and then share with us what was good um, because we want to make sure that, that we continue this relationship. So fantastic. Thanks, everybody, for staying with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you.